Hello again, welcome back to another episode. Today we're going to talk about the Limey, the Steven Soderbergh film from the late, from 1989 it reached about, but it was, or 2000, it was one of those, it came out just after um, Out of Sight, which is Soderbergh's kind of return to the mainstream, it came just before Erin Brockovich, which was his first big hit, before he had a run of big hits. Now Soderbergh's a weird talent, because he, he has had hits, but he's just as comfortable having films that are a bit more marginal and films that people only half seen. Like, see, you've seen you've seen it years ago or something like that, and people kind of half remember the films. And he's exactly he's, he's had so many films, we're never going to have seen them all. And sometimes films don't work. Sometimes he, he the director likes working. Sometimes I get a feeling he doesn't think through some of the films as close as he could. But then again, there's also films we really delivers on. So it could just be a case of where his talent goes and sometimes a subject matter is better than others. I mean, there's a lot of films that he made that I liked. I mean, I was a big fan of his, even from the off when he was a young director from Sex, Lives and Videotape. I was a big fan of his, like that and King of the Hill were both very good films. He had a couple of films at that time, Kafka and uh, Underneath, which didn't do as well, but they were interesting. The one success was very interesting. There were kind of films made by a talented director that didn't quite come together, but obviously you could see he had talent. And he made a couple of low-budget indie films that were basically zero-budget, like Shizopolis, which is wonderful. So there's lots of stuff he's made that is really terrific, even in the early days before The Limey. So The Limey was um, bringing him together with Lem Dobbs, who wrote Kafka. And Kafka was a famous sophomore jinx disaster. That nobody liked. I liked it, but it was a weird film, and it wasn't quite what the script was. Apparently, and apparently, it was a a difficult production for all involved. But Soderbergh liked Lem Dobbs as a writer, so they got together with the Limey as a kind of redemption thing. And then after that, they've they've done uh, the Gina Carino action movie later together as well. I can't remember the name of that one <laughs> just now. So they have worked again. It's like a it's a it's a, it's a good partnership because they, if you've ever heard in the commentary, they give each other they they don't hold back in criticisms of each other. <laughs> it's quite it's quite fun to to watch the commentaries. But it's uh there's also the of an interesting dynamic, like one a lot. Lem Dobbs is um, a more genre kind of guy. He's, he likes to twist twist the genres. I think. So does Soderbergh, but they do it in different ways. Like Soderbergh's a very visual, subversive person, and then Dobbs does it. The script, but I'm going to do it in a slightly different way from each other, which means there's a nice tension between them, so there's always something interesting going on. And this is, I think, the best one they did together, The Limey. It's, it's one of my favourites of the 90s. It's just a really solid film. It takes off from... Point blank, the John Berman film starring Lee Marvin, it's got that kind of feel, but it's, it's like taking that kind of plotline of someone traveling to a place they don't know, which is Los Angeles in both cases, and try to find something. And it's almost like a dream logic, because are they dreaming this whole story? It's all in their head, because you're going back and forth in their memory a lot of the time, and you're never quite sure if it's real or not. But the kind of the whole idea of the dream logic of um, they're going to do this thing. It probably happened, but it might not have happened. But it's having a character to have done all this stuff. But they seem to be um, it seems to go to easily for them in some ways. I was almost dreamlike, but it could have just been because the people they're facing off against weren't as good as they were. It's this kind of thing of um, what's the logic of a drama and what's the logic of a action movie is it taking off what your dream of it could be or is it taking off of um any sort of reality because any kind of action movie or revenge movie a lot of it does have that kind of dream logic to it it's like any schwarzenegger movie is a fantasy any Stallone movie is a fantasy but in this movie they bring it home and bring what's the, the emotional core of it all and what's driving it more than the just the explosions there's no explosions here it's just about a guy trying to find out what happened to his daughter now, this film has a great cast. I mean, you've got Terrence Stamp as a guy trying to find out what happened to his daughter. He's coming from England. He's called, he's called Wilson. He's a Cockney. And 
give Stamp a chance to go full on Cockney accent. He actually toned it down slightly so that it's not jarring, but it's still kind of broad accent. It's the broadest thing in the film in some ways. But have fun with it. Even though Stamp's not Cockney. You've also Peter Fonda as this guy who's a 60s businessman who's um, kind of marooned in the 90s and he's not quite sure where he fits in anymore. So he's got a melancholy to him as well as the Stamp character. And then uh, Stamp goes to find the friends of his daughter because his daughter has died in a car accident but no one's quite sure. Was it an accident or was it uh, something funny? And that's part of the dream logic of it is because uh, you've Stamp investigating was it an accident or not, but it could be him investigating his head trying to say was it something or wasn't it something or whatever. And it becomes this sort of uh, tale of what caused the accident and um, who's responsible ultimately. And it becomes a, a medical meditation on your own feelings as a person, your life feeling feelings. So um, Stamp meets up with the friends of his daughter who talked to him about her and what her life was because she, she left England and came to America to become an actress. She never really made it, but she had some friends there. And so you've, you've got Liz Ann Warren as an acting coach who does voiceover work and things. So she's someone who's got a career, not a massively successful career, but a career that works. It's like, um, it's like a middle-class career in acting where a lot of the work is like voice work and things. And you've got Louis Guzman as a, also who's also like learning to act, but he he'd been in prison for a while. He got out. He's still got a family. He's very much he knows what's in the streets, but he's he's keeping away from it. And Guzman becomes these two become the sidekicks of Stamp as he tries to find out what happens to the daughter. But Stamp's the kind of protagonist who's pushing forward always, but a very but, but, but sort of is always pulling back. So you've all these conversations take place in two or three locations. You're never quite sure, did he take place there, there, or there? Or is it how I remembered him, or does he not really remember it properly? Or is he imagining it? Or is he imagining these friends of his people, of his daughter, who he imagined what they would be? Or are they real? They're real enough to feel like characters, but they could be his imagination of the people his daughter might have hung around with and been nice people. Like Louis Guzman's character is a nice gangster, basically, or who are ex gangster, and is like the redeemed gangster. It's, which is very packed if you think of it as a dream. And then um, the the mother figure who's older than his daughter who looked out for her. That kind of thing. And you've also the daughter who was seen this guy, um the Peter Fond played by Peter Fonda, who was a bit dodgy. And I said, was he dodgy or did she, is he or was Stamp imagined he was dodgy? You're never quite sure. And that's what's wonderful about it, but it's always emotions of what he thinks these other people are, or what they actually are to him, because he even with them there, he doesn't quite fit in. He's he's too violent in his language and his actions, but he's trying to hold back, and he gets an emotional core. So he's 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 coming between what he was and coming back as a kind of older man who it's slowed down a little bit, but he still wants to know what happened. So this is a wonderful film. It's infused by memory of the 60s that may have never taken place, this idea of a time that... Because um, both Stamp and Fonda were defined by the 60s, really, but they were defined different ways. Stamp came from a working-class British gangster era in the 60s, which was just um, trying to survive and doing bank jobs and things, and he was like, the lowest of the working-class type of thing who was pulling jobs off. And Fonda was the rich guy who was exploiting the idea of the 60s just to make money. But they were both like exploitators of, of their societies. But they're coming from, from the rich side and the poor side. So you've seen two exploiters face off against each other. And you have two actors who were defined by the 60s as well. When Stamp was huge in the 1960s, so was Peter Fonda. In the 70s, uh, their star dimmed and then they just became character actors. Which is a good career for any actor. It's like... You're not no longer a star, but you're an actor that gets hired a lot. Sometimes small parts, sometimes important parts, sometimes the main parts. But you're always you're just staying in work, and both those actors always stayed in work. They're always interesting presences in the times, but they're always very defined by their roles in the sixties. So Fonda has this kind of pothead feeling because of Easy Rider and the trip and things, and 
Stamp has a kind of um, melancholy thing because he was always into like the Indian meditation things. So there was this kind of feel that bringing these two vibes, these characters who are one defined by being a businessman no one quite knows. Like even his friends don't really know him, you know. And and the the more you have seen with him, with his business part, the more he, he comes across less as a ethereal character, much more as a warrior and someone who has to always latch onto the new young thing because he feels he's left behind. And with Stamps' character, he's defined just by loss, like what he's lost. He's lost his wife. He's lost his daughter. He's trying to make sense of it, and he can't quite make sense of it. And as the film progresses, he starts to realise that her death may have been his fault more than anything because it, he wasn't a presence in her life. And he created like, trauma by always being a criminal that created elements within her personality that if pushed against if pushed against Fonda's kind of criminal, potentially criminal deeds may have caused a schism. Because she wasn't, she because she was so used to a criminal life in Britain, she couldn't stand for it. She wouldn't stand criminality. But that, but again, that's Stamp trying to. Did it happen, or is this what he's imagined it happened? It's like it's a meditation of what could be, what was, and how does any any of these actions really affect you? And is it all a dream? And it's wonderful because the dreamlike quality also creates a melancholy of. The past is something he can't get changed. And he can't change. He can, he can rearrange things in his head of what could have happened, what might have happened, what he could do to get revenge for it. But it doesn't really matter because she's still dead. He still lost her, and he still never got a chance to make up and find some sort of peace with her. So he, despite whatever he does, he's still lost. And no matter what kind of revenge he goes for. It's never going to be enough. So this is a beautiful film. This is just a wonderful film. It has a kind of what's really good about Soderbergh when he's on his um, on a roll, basically, which is just the kind of there's an emotionality to his films a lot of the time. It's just there, even if the genre goes against that. I mean, out of sight, it's a very emotional film, even though it's a light-hearted, like gangster crime movie. But still, there's some emotionality in the centre of it. There's a lot of films like that he does over the years. He just keeps going. He makes films. Like, I'm very fond of the Solaris remake, even though it's not as good as the original. It's still an interesting film. There's um, there's one called Bubble he made, which was terrific. All about the working classes that was pretty much ignored and no one cared, but it was a very interesting film. He was making these films in between the... Um, Ocean movies, which were much bigger, kind of sillier movies he was making. So he made me Che, part one and two, which I'm very fond of. And he, he retired for a bit, now he's come back. And Logan Lucky was good. There's a lot of films he's making. It's just one of the things, one of his careers that's really interesting. So sometimes you miss one or two of his films, then you go back and see them much later. He made a movie about the uh, about a pandemic, like in early 2010s before he did his retirement before he came back which contagion which um now as soon as the covid hit everyone was watching this was like oh my god it's like so he does a lot of stuff he did informant which is a really terrific film so 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 the line me is in line with a lot of his films he's been very influenced by richard lester who also was a director like this who made a lot of films some of which were more commercial some of which were more quieter like petulia and uh, robert and marion like, sort of like that weird, same mix of, he tries different things, sometimes it doesn't work, but it doesn't matter, because there's enough, there's enough good films that do work, to make up for the films that don't work as well. So he's always had an interesting career. I wish he would do another one with Liam Dobbs, because I think they're a good combination, but this one especially was a, just a wonderful film, it just really delivered, it, it kind of really caught the kind of, late career peak of Tim Stamp, where it was like, this was one of those films where, I was like, wow, he's really good. Because he can play it, like, broad when he's doing the cocking stuff. And it's kind of funny because he doesn't quite know how to fit into America. But he's also, there's a sadness to him there that's just there. And he just weighs the whole thing. Gives the whole thing, the sense of loss is always there. 
the sense of trying to make sense of something you can't make sense of is always there. And that kind of carries through the full film. You know. And Soderbergh's very sensitive to that and actually gives the tense of a lot of space to just be himself and not have to say lots of things all the time. Sometimes it's just him standing there thinking. And you see what he's thinking. is more interesting than what he's saying. So it's just a wonderful film. Why me is a terrific film. I highly recommend seeing it. It's hard to get a hold of in disc at the moment, but I would but you can get it on streaming, and I would rec highly recommend it. If you can get a DVD that has the commentary stuff, I would highly recommend it because those commentaries are great. So, the Lime is terrific. Just go see it. <laughs>